and good afternoon, Clayton County and fellow audience members, wherever you're with us from tonight. Uh, my name is Jasmine Bowles, and I'm so glad to be with you this afternoon. I am joined by the incredible Solicitor General here in Clayton County, Mr. Charles Brooks. Thank you for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here and excited about the conversation. Me too. I think we're doing the right thing at the right time for the right reasons, and I'd love for us to just jump in. So we'll tell you a little bit about who we are. Um, again, my name is Jasmine Bowles, and I have the honor of representing District 1 on the Clayton County Board of Education. And in that capacity, I'm with you I'm from South District 1, the so Lovejoy Fayetteville area. What about you, Mr. Brooks? Where are you joining us from? I am Charles Brooks from the Clayton County Solicitor General's Office. I am your Solicitor General uh, here in Clayton County. And most folks don't even know what a Solicitor General is. I'm not in the military. Uh, <laughs> I, I am a misdemeanor prosecutor. Uh, and that's the substance of this conversation. And so um, my jurisdiction is countywide. And so uh, from the north of the county at the airport to the south of the county in Hampton is uh, the span of the misdemeanor offenses that we cover in the solicitor's office. Amazing. Well, we look forward to hearing more about you, your role, and what you do for our neighbors here in Clayton. Um, and I think now's a good time to talk a little bit about why we're together. Folks might be wondering how and why a school board member is talking to a solicitor general, um, but I think we're actually kind of proud of our collaboration. So ultimately, as a school board member um, and former teacher, I think all the time about the way our community is impacted um, by the justice system. And one of those ways is you'll find that through job applications, credit checks, housing applications, there is that little question that says, have you ever been arrested? Um, and that checkbox or the ability to check that box really impacts a lot of folks' lives. And so we know that access to jobs, residency, and even some social services um, are caught up in our application process these days. And so with that in mind, I wanted to loop you in so that you can maybe help folks understand that there are still options and opportunities, that these barriers of access don't have to remain there. Um, what brings you here today? Why did you want to lean into this conversation? So. Um... Uh, when people traditionally think about prosecution and, and prosecution officers, they think um, um, of the law and order type figures who are strictly punitive. Um, but the, the truth is that most prosecutors or prosecutor offices are just as concerned about those things that impact our community related to jobs, related to housing, related to employment, uh, or excuse me, related to um, education as uh, as uh, as we are as we are concerned about criminal justice, uh, if if there are jobs, if there is housing, if there is if there is a uh, uh, education, then our work on the criminal justice side is lessened. Uh, and and like you, um, um, Madam uh, Board Member uh, Bowles, uh, I have a background in education as well. And so, if I, being a former teacher, I saw the pipeline from prison to, uh, from schools to prison, and so. Uh, in this role, I consider this a, an extension of my previous role as an educator. Mm. Thank you for talking about previous roles, because while we're talking about other pieces of our identity, I do want to point out I'm a proud product of Clayton County Public Schools. I graduated from Lovejoy High School, and I was wondering if you had any commonalities in that regard you wanted to shout out or acknowledge at this point. Well, time. definitely not Lovejoy High School, <laughs> but certainly Forest Park, <laughs> representing the Panthers. I love um, it. I'm a proud graduate of Forest Park High School, uh, class of 2000, uh, the millennial class. And so I'm, I'm glad to um, be serving in my community and glad to still uh, still see how, how our community is growing and changing and, and getting better every day. Thank you for saying that. I, I think it's important folks know that um, some of the people who are leading in the community are, you know, proud products of the same space. And that's really important to acknowledge. So let's jump in. Let's start talking a little bit about record restriction and why we're here and what all this means. So I'll be honest, you know, the first time we started having these conversations and even in my life, 
I think about the words record expungement, Mm -hmm. but you kindly have corrected me and helped me understand a little bit about what these terms mean. Can you help our viewers understand what is record expungement? What is record restriction? Why do we use those words? And what does that mean in this context? Well, uh, traditionally, uh, when people think about record expungement um, in Georgia, the is, is captioned or, or the, it's called record restriction. Uh, record restriction is basically that uh, any criminal uh, record information, including photographs and fingerprints, uh, may be restricted to uh, employers or private individuals um, seeking to uh, gather information on, on other people. Um, with the exception of law enforcement and, and law and and those seeking the information for law enforcement purposes. And so when you say uh, record restriction or expungement, um, the, the proper term in legal terms is record restriction. And basically, again, is that uh, I'm going to read you the, the exact language uh, of the statute. It says that the criminal history record information of an individual relating to a particular offense shall be available only to judicial officials and criminal justice agencies for law enforcement or criminal investigation purposes. So any outside agent, any outside private entity, uh, a job, an employer, a private investigator, or a private individual who's trying to seek information about your criminal history, uh, it, it, it may be restricted if there are certain statutory uh, requirements that are met uh, and, um, and the offense qualifies. Thank you, Solicitor Brooks. Is that is the statute you just read something applicable in Clayton County or all of Georgia? It is statewide. statewide. It's statewide. Uh, specifically, it's um, the official code of Georgia, uh, subsection 35-3-37, if anyone cares to um, look it up uh, for themselves. It's OCGA 35-337, and it's, it's a comprehensive uh, statute that lays out what the qualifications are, it lays out what the uh, what criteria is and timetables as well. Perfect. Thank you for that. Okay. Well, that is a nice segue to my next question. So you've helped us learn what record restriction means and what it is. Who is this for? I heard a little bit of it's for all Georgians. This is mm-hmm. applicable to all Georgians. But what type of neighbor or citizen or family member should we be telling this about? Well, um, if you are concerned with your criminal history, and most people should be, if you're not, <laughs> uh, for educational purposes, for employment purposes, for um, for uh, um, um, housing purposes, uh, if you have a, a conviction or a non-conviction, meaning you are arrested for something but it shows up on your criminal history, then that's the, those are the, that is a person who might be interested in a record restriction. Um, so it's two classes or maybe uh, two classes of folks who would be most concerned. The non-convicted, uh, meaning um, that you are arrested for something uh, and it shows up on your criminal history as an open item or the fir- or the people who were convicted. But because maybe uh, because it was so long ago or because of uh, uh, conditions of, of age, um, uh, you, you may be somebody who was a, a considered a youthful offender. You were young when the thing happened. Uh, you might be able to get that removed off your criminal history to uh, open up opportunities for um, advanced employment, um, better housing, and uh, and um, and uh, and educational reasons, uh, financial aid for education. Awesome. So it sounds like who is it for? Um, it sounds like people should be ready to explore this on a case by case basis, right? Absolutely. If you live in Absolutely. Georgia. Um, who should folks, what is step one? And, and I guess that's a nice segue to what is the process? What is it okay. like to engage? Well, the criminal history in Georgia is, is maintained as, um, by the GBI. Uh, the GCIC is what it's called. It's the Georgia Criminal Information Center. Uh, and, the GB, and, the, and it's housed within the GBI. And so if somebody were to uh, seek employment, they need to get a background check. Uh, the, whoever, the sheriff's department or the agency that does the background check will run what's called a GCIC. On the GCIC, it'll have what's called cycles. Each cycle represents an arrest. Okay, And within the cycle, uh, the arrest information will show what the arrest was for. It'll show the date. It'll show the outcome as well. Now, what happens in many cases 
um, the outcome might not be known. And so it might show as an open uh, open uh, case, or it might, may show something called dead docket or time expired. And so for those reasons, you wanna get those things off your history because if an employer sees that, they may think you have an open, open case somewhere um, and that might preclude you from employment or it may preclude you from certain type of housing or, uh, or educational advancement as well. And so uh, if you uh, go to the GBI, uh, uh, GCIC Center uh, and request a uh, audit or, or a copy of your uh, criminal history, uh, if you see some something inaccurate, you can make a request of the center and I believe they charge $15 minus um minus or excuse me in addition to whatever the charge is for fingerprints because they want to make certain that the person who is seeking this information uh, is entitled to have the information meaning that uh you can't necessarily go get another person's information from gcic you can get your own information from gcic and so then so you'll be uh charged uh the fee for fingerprints and administrative costs plus fifteen dollars uh, to run your history uh, if you see the inaccuracy, you can make a request of the center to correct the accuracy, correct the inaccuracy, and that's done with the agency, the arresting agency. So here in Clayton County, for example, if an individual was arrested um, by the Clayton County Police Department and they were taken to the Clayton County Jail, the Clayton County Jail would, um, the person would go to the Clayton County Jail, uh, fill out the application for record restriction. Uh, I believe there may be an administrative fee at the jail. I believe it may be $25. I don't know the exact cost because uh, that changes with uh, with various fees uh, associated with the state. Um, after filling out the application, and on the application, it's really just your name, the date of the arrest, what the incident was, and what you believe the outcome was, be it a dismissal, be it a uh, uh, dead docket or something to that effect. After that, this, uh, after filling out the face page of the application, it goes to the sheriff's department. The sheriff's department clerk uh, classifications will verify the charge, the name, the outcome, and then it's forwarded to the prosecution office. That can be either the solicitor's office, my office, uh, which, which handles all the misdemeanors for the county, or the district attorney's office, which handles the felonies for the county. After review by the prosecutor, if it meets certain statutory criteria that's within the statute, 35-337, then the, the application will be approved or denied and forwarded, the information be forwarded back to the applicant. Uh, if it's approved, then within 60 days, it'll be removed from, from your uh, criminal history. And if information was sent out, misinformation was sent out to a employer or um, a uh, uh, housing uh, um, facility or or even an academic facility. If if that information is known to the agency, they they are obligated to correct that with with uh, wherever they send the information to, be that the employer, the housing agency, or the academic um, institution. Thank you. It's in depth. <laughs> No, that was that was a very in depth explanation of the process, but I also think that's why we're here. Um, I think that's some of the information people crave. Can I dig a little? Probe Absolutely. A little? Absolutely. Okay, I've heard you mention more than once that folks have an application process to go through. You've given us the statute, which mm -hmm. I hope you repeat more times so people can write down. But I've heard you refer to some language like if it meets the statute. Mm -hmm. I would love for you to explain a little bit what you mean by that, because you've emphasized it. And mm -hmm. I, what I think what we'll learn is a little bit more about the eligibility requirements that go into this process. And I think viewers might wonder about that. Okay, is uh, if you were to think in terms of, uh, you can break cases down in two ways. Uh, there, there are cases that are disposed of or resolved prior to formal charges actually being drawn. And then there are cases that are resolved after former charges are being drawn. And uh, in terms of uh, legal terms, uh, we might say pre-accusation or pre-indictment or post-accusation, post-indictment, okay? Um, pre-accusation means that, or pre-accusation means that uh, an individual was arrested um, 
and the police agency, for whatever reason, they did not send the charge or the um, the information to the prosecuting attorney. Um, and for that reason, um, the case was never pursued. Maybe they maybe they investigated it to a dead end, and nothing nothing happened beyond the uh, simple arrest. It was just arrest, but no prosecution because there was no evidence to support support a conviction. Okay, that's pre accusation. Mm -hmm. um, maybe maybe the, uh, somebody got a citation, and the citation maybe it got lost uh, a clerical reason, um, or or it got misplaced, um, but it was never forwarded to the prosecuting office to actually pursue. That's one instance. Uh, another instance in pre-accusation is that uh, there are statutes of limitations. Uh, for, for misdemeanors, the statute of limitation is two years, okay? Uh, for felonies, the statute of limitation is four years. Um, if it's a serious felony um, of a sexual offense uh, with a, a, a minor, uh, involving a minor of 16 or younger, then, the, then limitation wise is seven years, statute of limitation is seven years. And so let's say police agency arrests a person and they investigate um, the case and it takes two and a half years to investigate the case, okay? If it's a misdemeanor offense, after two years, then that arrest is supposed to fall off that criminal history because, uh, because it's, it's called time expired. Um, within the statute of limitation, uh, it did not, they didn't forward it to the prosecutor in turn to actually pursue charges. Same thing with a, a felony offense. If they investigated and four years later uh, that no information is known or it was never pursued, pursued or forwarded to the prosecutor to indict the case, then it, it falls off the uh, criminal history. Uh, if it's a sexual offense involving a minor of 16 or younger, that's seven years. Now that's pre-accusation, pre-indictment. Post accusation, post indictment. Um, if uh, there are certain criteria uh, that a would allow for a record to be restricted after char formal charges are drawn, uh, for example, if a person is under twenty one and they are arrested and and even convicted uh, uh, of, of of a certain offense, for for me, let's say a misdemeanor offense. Uh, they will qualify as uh, something called a youthful offender. And if they qualify as a youthful offender, um, based on the, because of their youthfulness, because of their immaturity, because of their uh, inexperience in life, they were doing these things that they could have uh, avoided, but didn't. Um, the, there's a, there's a, a certain grace that's built into the statute that allows you to uh, remove that from your criminal history. Um, that's post post accusation, post conviction. Uh, let's say is uh, in another situation, if a person is con uh, former charges are drawn by the prosecuting attorney, um, but the case is um, convict uh, forwarded to the court and the person is put in a a diversion program, or a, or they are sentenced into a accountability court. Uh, accountability courts are are these treatment courts where, um, though the justice system is commonly thought of as a punitive system, it's also a system of rehabilitation. And so, these treatment courts are courts, specialized courts, where an individual who might say, for example, there there are these things called drug courts. Uh, an individual who has a substance abuse issue, if they're sentenced into a treatment court for drugs, uh, and they successfully complete that treatment court, uh, it can be drugs, it can be a mental health court. Uh, we have things called veterans court, um, parents court. There's all these specialized courts. If they're successful in these treatment courts, then uh, that conviction may fall off their uh, criminal history if they're successful in a uh, treatment court. Uh, that's another situation post accusation or post indictment. Uh, uh, another uh, situation is if, uh, if the charge is just dismissed, the prosecutor actually raises charges. Uh, it's time to go to trial or have a motion or whatever reason. Uh, the charge is dismissed. If it's dismissed, then that charge may be restricted off your record, meaning you're non convicted. Uh, you got arrested, you got charged, but the charge was ultimately dismissed. Then you may qualify for a, 
uh, a record restriction. And the last uh, situation is if, um, uh, and, excuse me, I'm referring to my notes because uh, it is a lot. <laughs> You're doing great, by the way. <laughs> First offender, if a person is convicted of a uh, uh, and, and they uh, enter their plea under first offender or something called conditional discharge. Conditional discharge applies only to like drug cases. Um, and it's their first offense related to a drug offense. If it's conditional discharge or first offender, um, after successfully completing probation, both uh, under conditional discharge or uh, and or uh, first offender, then that person uh, should qualify for record restriction. Under that, under that criteria, those are the circumstances where after accusation or after indictment, a person should qualify for record restriction. Whew. I am learning <laughs> so much. I'm learning so much and this is so important. So thank you again. Um, because the, part of what brings me is knowing that some of the barriers of access that impact my neighbors impact their these are parents of the students in our Clayton County Public Schools Absolutely. classrooms. And Absolutely. so when our parents don't have a resource that they need, it ultimately trickles down and impacts our scholars. Absolutely. So thank you again for making Absolutely. these connections. And, and, and by extension, um, I mean, it, it impacts um, some parents' ability to volunteer within the schools. That's right. Um, because I know there's criteria that to, to be a volunteer at your school. And so if there are these open uh, issues or open items that can be cleared, then let's clear them and get you the ability to get into school and be hands-on with our students. All of that. And I think that's actually, um, I want to keep anchoring us in the why so that folks know that like, we care. <laughs> this Absolutely. is, Absolutely. Um, you've got two Clayton County Public School alum and a plethora of other countywide leaders who really do care um, and want you to have this information. So I'm going to take a pause from the questions for a minute to um, actually encourage you. You're so humble, Solicitor Brooks. Um, I want you to brag on yourself a little bit, but also plant seeds or plug why we're doing this here now. So this is virtual, this is an info session. You and I thought through the fact that in many record expungement scenarios or workshops, folks don't know if they have to walk into a police station. Folks don't know if they're gonna walk in and be pulled to the side and taken from their Absolutely. family. Um, and there's all these, you know, trust issues with the justice Absolutely. system um, and our generation specifically. And we know that recent census data has revealed that Clayton County has one of the highest populations in Metro Atlanta for 30 somethings and mm -hmm. young folks in general. So this matters here, this matters now, this matters to us. Um, I'd love to hear you talk about what we're doing as the follow-up for this. Okay, absolutely. This is just where folks are tuning in. How, we wanted it to be safe, but what can people do next? And uh, per, per, I'm glad you said that. And, and let me add one more, uh, one more circumstance in which a person's record should should qualify for record restriction. If a person uh, is uh, charged, uh, police make their arrest. Uh, prosecutor actually does the charge, and a person actually goes to trial, and the jury finds them not guilty, meaning they are acquitted. Uh, at, at acquittal that charge will uh, qualify for record restriction as well. I mentioned, I forgot to mention that as well. Um, but in past, uh, the Solicitor General's office has done what's called record restriction um, fairs or summits. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that we've um, saw in past and in an upon review is that there's some serious trust issues in our community. Um, the purpose of the record restriction summit was an opportunity to give our citizenry um, a, a, a one-stop shop to really uh, work through clearing up uh, their records um, as well. And uh, had, we also had employers uh, to actually host uh, like, a, like a job here as well. Um, but uh, the numbers were so insignificant that uh, we had to identify why the numbers were that way. And, and what it really boils down to is trust. People, some people thought that it was like a warrant warrant roundup where we're trying to uh, find people who have open warrants. 
And that's because of our ineffectiveness and in making ourselves known and why we're here. Um, I would hate for anybody to first meet me in court. Um, because if you're fir the first time that you meet me, uh, the first time that you have ever even heard of me was in court, then the only thing you know of, of me is court, right? Right. Um, so that's why this conversation is important to, to me and it's to this office, because we are a part of this community. Uh, we directly impact this community and the quality of life um, issues that often we, uh, we hear about uh, and we deal with. Uh, relate to the work that we do within within this the solicitor's office. Um, so um, one of the things, one of the follow-ups to this conversation, uh, after explaining what record restriction is, is that we're going to try to host another record restriction summit. Um, the the purpose of again of the summit is a is a one-stop shop where you'll have the opportunity to get your records restricted with assistance potentially of the Georgia Justice Project. Uh, we hope to have employers uh, who will be uh, seeking um, job applicants. We hope to also include a resume workshop where we can assist in writing resumes. Uh, we, we want to have a, uh, a professional closet. If you don't have uh, a, appropriate um, uh, interview clothing, we want to get you suited and booted so, so you can get employed and advance. Um, I think one of the biggest issues as, rela as it relates to uh, quality of life is education, housing, and, cr and uh, criminal criminal histories. And so uh, if we can put all this stuff in one room, um, mesh it up, clean it up, and we can push out a great product. And I think that's, uh, that's what uh, this conversation is uh, intended to start uh, a groundswell for the summit. Uh, we hope to get the summit uh, done by the end of, excuse me, uh, by the end of this spring uh, leading into summer. It may roll into summer, but we're still in the early planning stages and more information is forthcoming from uh, both myself and Madam Bowes. I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you so much for um, bridging it for us, right? Like we're planting seeds now because there's more coming up. And Solicitor Brooks is right. For those of you watching, stay tuned because we're definitely going to be sharing more about part B to this. Um, okay, if it's all right with you, I'll get back to a few more questions. This, one of the questions is in the chat, it's talking about, is this being recorded? So yes, you can go back and watch this and or share it with all of your neighbors who may have missed this opportunity on Facebook and YouTube. And um, is there any way, Solicitor Brooks, you can provide some insight on the connection between record restriction and rental assistance? Um, well, uh, the, 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 what comes to mind first and foremost is a lot of times with rental census, they run, they run a criminal history. Uh, and if they are open, uh, if, if you're a convicted felon, uh, if there are open matters, uh, open criminal matters, felony matters, or, or in some cases, misdemeanor matters that may very well preclude you from getting the assistance that you're seeking. And so it's always better to have no history. But if you have any history, if you can clear things up, uh, then that then do clear them up. Um, one, one more thing as relates to record restriction, certain misdemeanor offenses. Uh, the law was recently changed in the last year or so um, where certain misdemeanor offenses, uh, if you have not had a, uh, a conviction or, or, or an arrest, excuse me, an arrest within the last four years, you can petition to the court to have a misdemeanor conviction removed. Uh, even if you're convicted and you don't and all the other criteria that I mentioned before, if if you uh, you get up to two convictions, misdemeanor convictions uh, in a lifetime that you can get that removed off your criminal history. Uh, as long as you have not had any uh, arrests within the last four years of seeking the removal. And so that's a that's another uh, benefit uh, to our citizenry to really clean up the history. Um, I, I want to credit. Um, uh, some of the uh, criminal justice reform things that, that, that has happened in our state uh, to former governor uh, Nathan Deal, who was a, a sponsor, a, a supporter of uh, accountability courts. Uh, 
Um, and also, uh, I believe uh, Governor Kemp is who actually signed um, signed uh, the the uh, amendment to the uh, to the statute governing restrictions presently. And so, for for everything that's happening in Georgia, good and bad, this is one of those things that is good and benefits everyone. Thank you. Um, I one of the questions is: Is there any reason? And so, I know that yes, there are reasons. What are some of the reasons that record restrictions could be denied? I think that's a really important question. Um, I want to shout out one of the incredible behind the scenes producers of tonight is Dr. Rump Carter. Um, who's also been a huge ally and supporter for both Solicitor Brooks and I. Um, but that was something that she raised that I think may apply to some of our neighbors. What does it mean to get denied? Um, and how can some folks, um, how can some of our neighbors, family, friends avoid that? And, um, you know, in the day of virtual Zooms, while you're answering that question, I'm going to go let my dog inside. Full transparency. No worries. No okay, worries. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, some of the reasons that might get a person uh, denied for a record restriction include um, um, a plea agreement um, where uh, an individual uh, enters a, a plea, um, in, which results in a conviction. Um, I own, um, let's say, let's say in most plea agreements, what happens is uh, there might be several charges and a person enters a plea to one of those charges. Entering a plea to one of those charges, if that charge came out of the same incident, then that might be a, uh, the, um, that's all considered one, I guess, one act. And so that, that could preclude you. Again, though, on the flip side of that, even with a plea agreement, after four years on misdemeanors, at least, after four years, if there is no, um, no new arrests, you can petition to have even that removed from your criminal history if you're successful on, on all the conditions of the sentence. Um, another reason that uh, get a person, uh, 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 or excuse me, another reason why a person's record may not be restricted, uh, if it's a pattern of conduct, meaning you have multiple arrests for the same type of, be same type of uh, behavior, um, uh, if it's shoplifting, say for example, you got seven seven shoplifting arrests in a in a seven year period uh, that may be a reason for your record not being restricted because it's a pattern of conduct um if you're found guilty by a jury if you're found guilty by a jury that'll be a basis for a record not being restricted uh, ultimately what ends up happening in in all of these scenarios even if you disagree with the outcome of the prosecutors um, a recommendation as it relates to the restriction. A person has an a opportunity to appeal to the court, uh, whichever court was the sentencing court, be it a state court or a superior court. A person can file an appeal um, to the uh, to the state court judge and say that uh, if they can show that by preponderance of evidence that the, the benefit to the public is far less than the harm to the individual then the, the judge or the court may find that uh, the, the benefit is less than the harm and, and ultimately restricted. Uh, it's just, it's very fact, fact specific to the case and to the uh, to charge and to the history. Yeah, it, it, you, you're doing so well with answering these questions, but you know, so much of what we're learning here is it really is a case by case basis and everyone should at least try and or start and or initiate um, the process because the answer just won't be the same for everybody. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, the questions are coming in rapid fire. Shout out to wherever you are and wherever you're watching this. Uh, we'll try to get through as many questions we can. Um, we're talking about the record restriction opportunity here in Georgia. What about Georgia residents who acquired charges in another state? So record restriction in Georgia, um, OCJ 35-3-37, again, that's OCJ 35-3-37 only applies to Georgia. And so if there, if someone uh, was convicted in another state, uh, then that they would have to pursue a restriction in that state uh, with the laws governing, governing that state. Um, this record restriction relates to the Georgia Criminal Information Center. 
uh, and the Georgia GCIC or Georgia Criminal Histories. And so uh, there is a national um, database called the NCIC, and that's what the FBI uses to run national histories to see convictions in multiple states. Um, but for the, for the most part, employers in, in this state generally rely on your, your in-state history. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, we're actually getting some questions that I'm gonna try to summarize. And they are around the idea of, we know you as Solicitor General, General thanks to what we've learned from you to this afternoon, your office oversees misdemeanor charges in Clayton County. That's correct. We're having some questions about two things. One, can you have a misdemeanor restricted and a felony restricted? Is all of this conversation just about misdemeanors? Um, or can you also have a felony conviction removed? And if so, is that your office? Is that the same process? Um, can you help us understand the difference between those who may want to remove a felony and those who may need to re remove a misdemeanor? So record restriction applies to both felonies and misdemeanors. Um, the process is, is the same between, uh, between uh, felonies and misdemeanors. The difference is who's reviewing. If it's a misdemeanor, my office, the Solicitor General's office, will be reviewing on misdemeanors. If it's a felony, the district attorney's office will be reviewing um, for felony convictions. A and ultimately, um, if, it's, if it needs to be appealed based on the decision of either my office or the DA's office, then uh, it'll be appealed to either the state court or the superior court. State court is for misdemeanors, superior court is for felonies. So helpful, so helpful, Solicitor Brooks, thank you. And so, we know that two different offices look at misdemeanors and felonies, but just so that our viewers are clear, the process to start the restriction process is the same for both. Yes. Very awesome. Yes. Okay. Um, how much does this cost? We have a question about what's the fee, and I think earlier you mentioned a couple of opportunities, mm -hmm. you know, where folks may have to spend a little money. Uh, we hate barriers of access, but we want everybody to know what they need to know. So you mentioned getting your report, which yeah. sounds important. Um, yeah. And then you also mentioned something, a fee to actually um, an administrative fee, potentially. So the GCIC to run to get your criminal history, I, I believe GBI charge is $15. Uh, minus, uh, $15 minus uh, the additional cost that it would uh, take to get your fingerprints ran. Right. Uh, I believe GCIC requires that you um, actually prove your identity, and they do that by verifying your identity with your fingerprints. Uh, so that's $15 plus the cost of fingerprints. Um, but when you're actually doing the application itself um, through the sheriff's department or the arresting agency, um, is I believe the cost is $25. Now, some people, some people elect to hire an attorney. And um, and if you hire an attorney, then that's just based on the cost that that attorney charges. Uh, and then oftentimes attorney, they'll build in the cost for uh, for the application and the re review within their fee structure. Um, is an attorney required? No, an attorney is not required. Uh, although an attorney is helpful, uh, just expedites and, and, and convenience like most things. When things are convenient, they often cost more. Um, but uh, if you if you got the fortitude to do it yourself, then is something that every individual can do themselves. Thank you for keeping an eye on the chat because that is definitely the next question. One of the viewers has written, does this process require an attorney? And just to repeat the answer, Solicitor Brooks said, it does not require an attorney. You can undergo this by yourself. Obviously, you can get an attorney and that may help. Um, and we know again that that may or may not be fair, but that is the answer to the question about this does not require an attorney. So don't let that stop you if you don't have Absolutely. to. Um, I think there's actually a pretty unique question I would love to pitch your way. All right, okay. here's, ultimately this person wants to know if you can still apply for a record restriction while on probation. And that is either felony probation or otherwise. 
and it's non-reporting um, probation, but they've complied with everything? The, the short answer is no. Uh, the sentence must be complete and there's generally a, a waiting period after after completion of the sentence uh, um, for uh, if you if you actually are convicted for misdemeanors, it's four years uh, after uh, after the conviction with no arrest. Um, but the, the sentence must be successfully completed. Thank you. All right. Um, let's see. There, there is one additional um, thing that I did want to um, mention as well uh, related to record restriction. So um, a person can successfully have their record restricted, expunged, restricted uh, from public view uh, to employers or private individuals. Um, but there is another process called to seal the record. Okay. Uh, and that's a to seal the record. You can restrict your record. And then the next step is to seal your record. Um, have you ever gone on Google, typed in a celebrity's name, and they, you were able to pull up their mugshot? Right. Okay. Um, uh, that's because their record was never sealed or, um, or, or perhaps they got to the internet before they could uh, do the sale. Um, when you seal the record, that means that the record is no longer publicly available and cannot be reported by private background companies. Uh, a lot of uh, companies will do, uh, they have private background companies that will go to individual jurisdictions. So I might be a private investigator. I might go to Clayton County. I might go to Gwinnett County. I might go to DeKalb County, Fulton County, and all the metro counties of this area individually and go to the clerk's office and ask, uh, do you, is there any record of an arrest or conviction on this individual? Okay, to the clerk individually. Uh, if there is a record, then the clerk uh, must produce that, right? Um, that if... If you had your record sealed, then the, the clerk could not publicly release that information. And so when you restrict the record, uh, the next step is to seal it so that uh, mug shots, um, any uh, local local history cannot be released to anybody under any circumstances with the exception of law enforcement. So helpful. And that's a question I never would have asked on my own, and it certainly didn't come up in any of the chats. So I really appreciate you mentioning that. Um, and just to, again, loop that for the viewers, this is an info session so that you feel empowered and um, informed before you take the next step. But Solicitor Books is working with a host of organizations and partners for a part two, where you can show up in person and begin the process. But what we've also learned is that we're using the words record restriction, which will benefit those who've been kept from access and opportunities. But there's another level called sealing your record, which is only possible after this one takes place. And that may be something folks want to explore later. That's right. That's right. And, and, and to be clear, to seal your record means that your, that your record was already restricted. Okay, you cannot seal your record without your record being restricted. Um, Important. Basically, basically, what ends up happening, uh, a company or in a private investigator will do what's called an open records request. And because these are government entities, we must respond to the open records. Uh, if your record is sealed, then the government can say, well, uh, by judicial order, cannot release this information. I'm learning so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's see, we only have a few minutes left and I wanna make sure folks are getting what they need. Dr. Carter, feel free to jump in if you see anything on social media. Um, I think this will be one of our last questions here on our Zoom chat. So pan attendees, if you are watching this panel, please um, pump out your final questions. And I, again, thank you Solicitor Brooks because I'm learning a ton, but I know the viewers are too. This question is about um, upon restricting and then sealing a record, would a potential applicant be able to apply to a federal government job? It depends. Uh, is it a federal law enforcement agency? Great. Uh, if it, it if it's it it really just depends on the agency itself. 
um, third, because it's because it's government. Um, if it's law enforcement, then law enforcement can see all history, um, sealed or not sealed. Uh, if it's an uh, uh, administrative agency, uh, perhaps not, but it's based on the criteria of that agency. Um, so I can't speak. I can't speak definitively because it's really dependent on the agency itself. Yep. That's okay. Case by case basis is uh, one of the themes we're learning for tonight, and that's all right. Um, you know, this is one of the questions that we thought through solicitor books for this, but it's going to happen, um, especially as our community and our justice system tries to build bridges. But someone asked, frankly, mm -hmm. this is virtual at our next meeting that's in person. If you want your record restricted, and there's a warrant out mm -hmm. for your arrest, will you be arrested? If you uh, if you have a warrant and a law enforcement official knows that you have a warrant, then they are obligated to arrest you if they have arrest powers. Um, like for example, I don't have arrest powers, so I'm a prosecutor, I'm not a, a police officer or a person with arrest powers, but if a law enforcement official who has arrest powers know that you are a wanted person, uh, then you will be arrested. Now. On, as an officer of the court, um, I am obligated to tell you you sh you should turn yourself in as well and resolve and and resolve the issue that caused the warrant to be uh, effectuated or executed. Um, but um, the, the short answer is record restriction uh, is on the backside of of the matter being addressed, um, but you can't address the record restriction without addressing the matter on the front side. Thank you. All right. Um, look, as we close out, I just want to give another thank you to everyone who's watching. Um, and Solicitor Brooks, as you sign off with whatever's on your heart, whatever's on your mind, whatever message you want to end with, could you please remind folks one more time about how, no matter where they're watching mm -hmm. in Georgia, how do you even start? Um, folks want to know, like, do you just walk up to your county office and request this stuff? Um, and uh, we're getting a last minute question that I'm tempted to raise. Okay, um, can you address sex offenders really quickly? We did, we have had some questions about sex offenders, but I'm not mm -hmm. sure if it's about felonies or misdemeanors, but maybe you can help folks um, understand. There, there are a class of cases that record restriction is, is unavailable. Um, most sexual offenses, record restriction is not available um, because there is a the benefit to the public outweighs the individual harm, um, the individual's benefit of privacy um, because because sex, sex offender registries are public uh, so that folks can know where sex offenders exist uh, for children or whatnot. Um, so uh, most sexual offenses fall within the within the excluded line of criminal offenses that uh, that are not available for record restriction. Thank you. All right. Um, we are now going to, I hate to shut down the questions. You guys are asking such good ones. Um, I will repeat for anyone wondering, this is being recorded and will be viewable after this moment on Facebook and YouTube. That's youtube.com slash CCPS news. And that is Facebook.com. Actually, this is streaming on my page at JBO for Clayco. So Facebook.com slash JBO, the number four Clayco. And again, my name is Jasmine Bowles and I represent District One on the Board of Education. And um, Solicitor Brooks, I would love for you to sign off with your final thoughts or words. And again, thank you so, so much for making this happen. No, I am glad to be here. I'm glad to. I'm glad you invited me the opportunity to to partner and have this conversation. Um, I want to. Uh, I want to encourage folks to to look at the statute themselves as well. Um, uh, they, they say uh, people may perish because of lack of knowledge, and so it's not that uh, any individual knows everything. Is that um, the individual doesn't know where to look for the thing, and so. This code section that controls everything that I just talked about. I'm not. I'm not the smartest guy in the room or anything like that. I'm, I'm reading from paper. Uh, it can be found on uh, OCGA or Official Code of Georgia, 35-3-37. Uh, that's 
35-3-37. If there's a question of uh, interpretation, uh, you can also get information from the Georgia Justice Project. Uh, they uh, they often assist folks with filling out the application for uh, for record restriction. Uh, the Georgia Justice Project has a website that's www.gjp.org. Uh, they also have a telephone number that's 404-827-0027. And they have a, uh, a whole guidebook related to record restriction and understanding uh, how to correct your uh, criminal record in Georgia. Um, the purpose and the point of this conversation is really to bridge a gap between between the criminal justice system, uh, our courts here in Clayton County and our community, um, and, and let folks know that the courts are far more than punitive. Um, the one side, of course, is punitive, but the other side of court is rehabilitation and restoration. And uh, to get to rehabilitation and restoration, we have to do things like clean your history so that uh, that that uh, there are certain uh, life advancements related to housing, related to employment, related to education. And if I can be of any assistance in any way to do that, then I'll gladly do that. Uh, now, I can't guarantee that every application that comes to the solicitor's office will be one that will, uh, that the record will be restricted. However, if it qualifies, then we'll gladly, uh, gladly sign off on it. Um, to the extent that uh, that it does not qualify, if you speak to the folks, to the attorneys at the Georgia Justice Project, there may be other avenues that you can pursue to get your record clean. Um, and um, uh, because uh, there, because of the rules of the state bar of Georgia, I can't give legal advice, um, but I can direct you to uh, direct you to folks who can assist in that way. And uh, some of those folks who are at the Georgia Justice Project. So thank you. Uh, Ms. Bowles for uh, allowing me to partner with you in the school system and, and having this conversation. And I look forward to a, a future partnership as relates to the Record Restriction Summit coming in the near future. Me too. Thank you so much for that incredible sign off, Solicitor Brooks, and for all of the knowledge that you shared with me and all of the attendees both now and those who are going to be tuning in later. Um, again, I want you all to know that this is important to us, not only because we are leaders here and we grew up here, but also so many of the people most impacted by our conversation today are in our classrooms. And so it's critical that we care about our neighbors, no matter how old they are, because our neighbors might have scholars or grandchildren, um, and it takes a village. So it's it's a little hypocritical for us to care about humans until they turn 18 and then throw them out, right? No, yeah. we want to care about folks from cradle to college and beyond. And so hope you've learned something today. Hope you're leaving a little more enlightened than you came. Thank you for everyone who is tuning in. Um, and Dr. Carter is signing us off. So for more info, www.jgp.org or reach out to myself or Solicitor Brooks. Thank you so much. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. All right.